Okay, uh, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute of Computational Science here at Dartmouth College, and on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this year's Winter Donahoe Colloquium, the conservation of Tullio Lombard's Adam, a conversation between art and science. Presented to us by Carolyn Riccardelli of the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Patrick Cunningham and Michael Back of the engineering firm CAE Associates. Ah. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and enable and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible by the generosity of Bill Newcomb, a former trustee of the college. The projects and ideas supported by the Newcomb Institute span the spectrum of human interests. They come from medicine, the sciences, and the social sciences, and notably the humanities and the arts. Many of us are well aware of the deeply entwined fashion in which computational achievements are both integral to as well as inspired by the need to create art. This is perhaps most apparent in music and movie making and has been well represented by previous colloquia. But equally inspiring is the centrality of computational and even mathematical ideas in the process of art conservation. Digital remasterings of a Caruso aria or an image processing effort that enables the recovery of a 13th century palimpsest of the writings of Archimedes both show that when, even when it comes to the recreation of creative work, computation and the arts are also inspiring each other to ever greater achievements. Perhaps in no instance is this more apparent than in the story that we will hear today. Our guests bring to us the moving tale of the restoration, really the reincarnation, of a magnificent and beautiful piece of Renaissance artwork, Tullio Lombardo's Adam sculpture, that seemed to have been lost forever when in 2002 in one of the galleries in the New, in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, it fell to the ground and shattered. Its restoration is a remarkable story of the power of collaborative work, in this case, binding together art, history, artisanship, engineering, applied mathematics, and computing in the mission of resurrecting an historic and exquisite cultural landmark. Carolyn Riccardelli, Michael Back, and Patrick Cunningham are three key participants in the multidisciplinary effort that made this happen, and we are very pleased and, given the weather, quite lucky to have them with us today to tell us about the restoration of Adam. Carolyn Riccardelli is a, con is a conservator in the Department of Objects Conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she is in charge of large-scale objects, as well as being one of the primary coordinators of the department's active graduate internship program. She's an active member of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and is currently serving on their board of directors. Carolyn holds a BA in Anthropology from Newcomb College, Tulane University, and an MA from the Art Conservation Program at Buffalo State College. She was the principal member of team of conservators and scientists conducting research on the appropriate adhesives and pinning materials for the sculpture, as well as developing innovative methods for reassembling the sculpture. Michael Back and Peter Cunningham are senior engineering managers at the engineering firm CAE Associates in Middlebury, Connecticut which specializes in the structural and computational analysis of complex engineering problems, and in particular, the restoration of Adam. Michael's expertise ranges over a broad swath of applied and computational mathematics from finite element analysis to fracture mechanics. In addition to his work at CAE in mechanical engineering, he also develops and teaches engineering courses as an adjunct professor and lecturer at Rensselaer in Hartford and Central Connecticut State University. Pat has made his mark in a variety of engineering and manufacturing environments. His patents and award-winning work can be found in the machine design of plastic and rubber processing equipment, high-power ultrasonics, and even, elevator, and even elevator design. At CAE, his current responsibilities include all phases of mechanical engineering on, and on the consulting projects. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn, Michael, and Pat for our 2015 Winter Donahoe Colloquium. Thank you.
Thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's snowing, which you're all <laughs> used to, but <laughs> still, it's quite a snowy day. So thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm going to get started. I'm going to give a, a basic overview of the project. I'm going to talk about the research um, that went into choosing the adhesives and pinning materials for the sculpture. And then I'm going to talk about the, um, the treatment itself, the of reassembly of the sculpture. And then I'm going to pass it over to Mike and Pat, who are going to talk in detail about some of the finite element analysis we did. Um, particularly looking at um, pinning in one of the sculpture's knees. So let's get started. Oops, I have to, I'm in the wrong mode, excuse me. There we go. I like to see my notes. <laughs> so um, Tullio Lombardo's Adam is one of the figures from the Venderman tomb, which is located in the church of Santi, um, Giovanni e Paolo in Venice, and he's dated uh, to about 1495, and it's considered to be one of the most important monumental Renaissance sculptures in the Western Hemisphere. And it was acquired by the Met in 1936, and that's when this um, photograph was taken. This is before it fell down. <laughs> and um, in 2002, just like Dan said, the sculpture fell down when the pedestal beneath it collapsed. And the sculpture is made of Carrara marble, uh, which is, it's a very high quality Carrara. And um, it broke into about 28 large fragments and uh, hundreds of little tiny fragments. And in the accident, the extremities of the figure, the arms, legs, and the tree trunk um, broke the, um, the most. And, and the head and the torso were actually the least damaged and suffered minor losses only, which is really, was very lucky because, and as you can see at the end, when I show you a picture of the restored sculpture, the core of the sculpture and his face and the real spirit of it is there, and you really don't notice the damage. I mean, I think we did a good job putting it back together, but we were very lucky in the way that it, it broke. Um, I just wanted to show you quickly a picture of the Venderman Monument. And you can get an idea of the scale of this tomb by imagining Adam, who is about six feet, three inches tall. And he was located in this niche that's on the left, where the man is standing. There's a sort of a warrior figure there now. Um, those two warrior figures that are in the dark niches, those were on, those were on the outside. And these, there's two female figures that are not original. So take those away, put the warriors on the outside and put Adam in this niche. And there was an Eve originally. Uh, we don't, she's now lost to the ages. Um, uh, we'd actually not even sure if she was ever made. Um, but we do have an Eve that c goes with the tomb, but it's not a match for Adam. It's a much later mannerist figure. Um, but that gives you a scale of where it came from and, and how he was placed in a niche um, so, in 2002, when the sculpture <laughs> fell, he was, hi Bella, <laughs> I'm just seeing somebody familiar in the audience. Um, uh, it, in 2002, he was located in this uh, place at the Metropolitan Museum, and this is the um, Vela's Blanco patio. This picture was actually taken in the 60s, and today we have a slightly, a, the, the space is the same, but the floor is different. It has a white marble floor. Um, but this is where he was, and approximately in that location in the space. And when the sculpture fell, because it was, it's, it's a real slick marble floor, uh, the fragments really went everywhere. And as a way of getting in control and managing the situation, uh, we approached sort of like an archaeological dig where we gridded off um, we didn't have to grid it off because we took advantage of the rectangular floor tiles in the, in the space. Each one got a letter and a number, and we just put it down there with masking tape, and each one was photographed. Um, here are just two uh, details of that. What you see here is the base. It's pretty obvious 
um, but you have a piece of the uh, left thigh. Sorry, I'm not good with my left and right, so I might say it wrong sometimes in the talk, but <laughs> we'll get past it. That's a piece of the upper right arm, um, piece of the forearm over there, and then that's a calf. Frag oh, no, no, that's the tree trunk. Sorry, from here it looked like a calf, but it's a tree trunk, the lower part of the tree trunk. So those are just two of the squares, and then we had we have dozens of these images. Um, and sometimes there was just one little morsel and dust and things like that. But really it was kind of only the walls of the space that contained the fragments. Um, so at this point, there really was kind of a pause. We, we cleaned it all up. It was stored away carefully, but we didn't immediately go um, and, and start working on the sculpture. There was a, a period to take some time and consider how we would approach the sculpture. And then, but really from the very beginning, we knew we were gonna repair the sculpture. There was never any doubt in our minds, especially as conservators, that we would be able to do it. Um, and the museum was 100% behind the, the restoration of the sculpture. But in the, in the interim period between when we really started working on the sculpture itself, we pulled together a team of people, including myself, but there's uh, several conservators and there were several curators involved. And then we also worked with Princeton University School of Engineering and Applied Science. And we worked with um, not just CAE, but with another um, engineering company in, uh, based in Boston called Simpson, Gumpers, and Hager. And they serve sort of an advisory um, purpose in, in our discussions. There's a lot of discussions. And then Ron Street, who was a really important part of our team, he's not a conservator, but he works in the Met in our reproductions in our uh, for a merchandising department, and he creates reproductions of sculptures that we sell in the in the museum shop. Excuse me, in the museum shop. So he's a really skilled sculptor and has a lot of experience with 3D uh, scanning. And that was really the first thing that happened um, <clears throat> was the 3D scanning. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. So the first few years of the accident were really just dedicated to examination of the, of the fragments of uh, the 3D laser scanning. And then eventually, we, it took a while even just to find a space to work on this. It's not so easy to find available space at the Met. And um, this photo was taken in 2007. So that gives you an idea. This was just when we first moved into our new Tulio studio. Um, so that's, that's a lot of years before we really got to a point where we could start working. Um, but that shows the, the, some of the major fragments there. Um, but you also see hundreds of little tiny fragments. Each one of those bags has a tiny fragment inside of it. So we um, started by sorting and looking for exterior fragments because the inside of the sculpture was quite white. The exterior has a sort of beautiful yellow patina. And so it's really easy to identify um, the interior versus exterior. So we just put aside the interior fragments. We, we knew we weren't gonna try to um, put those back. Um, but they're saved. They're all organized in a nice box somewhere in the Met. <laughs> um, but so when we found, we just started looking at these fragments, getting uh, familiar with them. And when we found a location, we couldn't immediately put it in place. We couldn't adhere it in place because there were so many fragments. And maybe you know, two years later, you might find one that goes underneath it or slightly overlaps it. So we didn't want to lock ourselves out. And so we developed a system to keep track of the fragments. And here, you're looking at the top of um, Adam's tree trunk, which is you're looking down on this right here. It's a little bit of a funny image, but so what we did was um, when we found a location of the fragment, we um, assigned it a new number. We, we kept track of these Velas Blanco grid numbers, but we also, when it was uh, a location was found, we assigned it a new number. And then um, we did a detailed series of photographs 
that was taken when, when we started at constructing an area more completely. And we did a sequence like this. None of these are adhered yet. But this kind of sequence, when we eventually did get to that time to put them on, each one of those was in its own little bag with its number. And we could just <coughs> quickly go through and attach them. When we decided we were pretty much done, like that's as much as we're going to find. And then we would put them on. Um, so here is a scale model similar to this one that Ron Street made. It um, was created by using the laser scan data. And it represents the condition of the sculpture um, after it broke. And it really clearly shows the breaks and losses. And this little model was an invaluable tool throughout the treatment of a sculpture. Just There was nothing like having a three-dimensional version of the assembled sculpture. I mean, you have to understand the sculpture was just in pieces all over tables. So it was great to have this visualization tool. And one of the things we knew right away was that this really beautiful Carrara marble snapped very cleanly. And the, these fragments fit together very tightly. Um, so we knew that the displacement of the fragments uh, was a critical component of what we had to consider when we were looking for an adhesive. Um, the, so we, we didn't want to, in other words, the adhesive, the thickness of the adhesive was important. We had an uneven number of breaks on each leg. So we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six on one leg, and only three on the other. So if you're adding dimension from an adhesive, uh, you still need to add up to the torso at the top. So this was a really important um, characteristic of an adhesive to us. We wanted a strong adhesive, but um, we also wanted a very thin adhesive. Um, so many of the breaks are in compression, sort of pushing down straight parallel or perpendicular to the floor. <laughs> um, and, and, but there were a few breaks that are in a combination of compression, tension, and shear. And those red lines are really the places where we had the most important questions. Um, so just to, because we're going to talk about compression and tension and shear and everything, I wanted to show you some diagrams that would help you um, understand that compressive forces are always pushing together. They're perpendicular to the floor. And it's just basically like the force of gravity on a joint. And then shear forces occur when they're opposite forces sliding against each other. And in Adam, our most complicated joints had a combination of compression and shear. Um, and then, and that's really in the knees and the ankles. And then tension is where you have forces that are pulling away. And we see that in Adam's arm, um, both of the arms, which are essentially like hanging off the torso without much support from underneath. And one of the most critical joints of the sculpture is at the ankles, where the weight of the entire sculpture rests on the smallest surface, surface area. And those are um, really at a very sharp angle. And then at the other break that experiences a combination of compression and shear is at the knee, where we had a wedge-shaped fragment bridging the shin and the thigh of the left leg. And um, it's also important to know that the sculpture weighs about 780 pounds. And therefore, the ankles support 85 to 90 percent of that weight. They're, it's distributed. The weight of the sculpture is distributed between the three columns, essentially, of the sculpture. Um, but a lot of that is on the ankles. Okay. And so, like I mentioned, one of the very first things that was um, occurred is uh, laser scanning, and it created, it was a sort of, we called it the virtual atom project. So 3D laser scans were performed on every single one of the, the major fragments. Um, and then the data from those laser scans were assembled into a virtual model. And as far as we're aware, this is the first time something has been uh, scanned in pieces and then assembled. This was something we didn't even know was possible to create a working finite element um, model, but um, this is something that Ron worked on with the CAE guys, and um, it turned out they were able to do it, and we're very glad they did because the finite element analysis 
throughout the project was really important to our research. Um, so this, we have a few different um, stages of the of this modeling. So it started out with a point cloud. That's from the data. That's the data from the scan itself. And um, then we moving through time, basically, all the way to this bonded, fully bonded version of Adam. So where we've taken away all of the breaks. And these guys are going to explain a lot more about that later. But just want to get you a little bit familiar with it. Um, so the product of the finite element analysis is an engineering, computer engineering analysis, um, is a graphical representation or a stress plot that shows the types, the amount and the type of force on each joint in the sculpture. And this diagram over there shows um, a stress plot that shows the um, compressive and tensile stress on the fracture just above the left knee. And um, one of the things that we found at the end of this finite element analysis was that there was not one place on the sculpture where the, um, the, the load on each joint, it, does, it never exceeds 100 pounds per square inch. So you think of this very large sculpture, six foot tall, um, 780 pound sculpture, and the, the forces on, on the joints were actually quite small. Surprisingly small, at least that's what we thought was surprising. Um, and that was really important to uh, our research in adhesives because then we could narrow in on finding just the right type of adhesive, one that wasn't overly strong or one that wasn't too weak. So um, the goal of our materials research, this was the next phase after we did this finite element analysis, we felt like we better understood the structure of the sculpture. Um, we wanted to look at um, adhesives and pins because this is the way that conservators put sculptures together. And we didn't want to just use the standard materials, which is currently epoxy and stainless steel pins. But we knew that this sculpture had some special issues, has really tight joints. It um, it's never been broken before. It doesn't have holes from previous restorations. Um, it also, you know, we, we, knew, we know a lot more about adhesives now because some recent research into acrylic adhesives um, has been done. This was at the beginning of this um, part of the project that was telling us that acrylic adhesives, which are reversible and um, pref preferred by conservators because of that reversibility, um, are quite possibly strong enough to uh, adhere an entire sculpture together. Um, so we wanted to look more closely at that. So we wanted the least amount of in intervention. In other, in other words, we wanted to drill for pins only where it was absolutely necessary. We wanted reversibility. Um, and we also wanted very tight joints or a thin, bo thin bond width. Okay, so at the starting point of the structural portion, we, um, we began with an interfacial fracture toughness study. And this is just another way of looking at um, strength. It's a, it's a more focused method, and it's more, accept, more commonly found in the fracture mechanics world. And this was something that was completely new to us and hadn't been tried on in a conservation study before. Um, but we teamed up with the um, engineering school at Princeton. And we had um, a graduate student at Columbia University named Merceda Giorgiani. And she was the one who took on this project. And um, we really just wanted to establish a protocol for adhesive testing and look at the interfacial toughness and assess the bond widths uh, and their correlation to toughness. And just to define fracture toughness, because this was new to us for sure uh, at the time. So it really describes the ability of a material containing a crack to resist fracture. Um, so this is just, it, it's, a, it's a better way um, to look at at strength testing. It's not just on one very specific stress, stress analysis. It takes into account a lot more um, components of the 
and Mike might actually talk about this a little bit more. Um, but the strength measurement is, is simpler, simpler to carry out, um, but this one is a little more accepted in the mechanics community. It's more accurate and quantitative and reliable. So we started that process, and this is sort of what it looked like. There are these little disks of um, Carrara marble, and they're called Brazil disks. And um, they were, they have a little elliptical hole that sort of forces a flaw. It's, a, it's like a built-in flaw in the specimen. And that forces uh, the, a crack to occur all from the same central location, as opposed to depending on whatever random features might be found in the stone. So these specimens were um, glued together with various different adhesives, and then they were tested um, on an instron, that, which you're looking at the shiny parts, is an instron machine that pushes down and takes measurements on the force. And so what we did was you test it at the, with the elliptical hole at various position, positions, each, each specimen placed at a different position. Um, we looked at uh, thermoplastic adhesives, which are um, adhesives that's set by solvent evaporation. And these are our, our nice reversible adhesives. Um, one of the, we're gonna talk about one is B72. It's an acrylic adhesive. And then thermosetting, these are just broad categories of adhesives. Another one is thermosetting adhesives. And these are really what we know as epoxy. They cure by chemical reaction. Um, and they're very, very, very strong. In fact, maybe far too strong for something like the sculpture. Um, they, they're, which is good, but they're quite difficult to reverse. So we're trying to avoid using them in conservation as much as possible. Um, so these are squeezed in the instron until it breaks. And then the result is a graph that looks like this. It sort of describes um, it describes the fracture energy of the, of the stone, uh, of the joined stone, I should say. And then we compared it to marble alone. So I'm compressing this down into just a few minutes here, but each one of these um, adhesive systems was compared to the, to the stone it, alone. And the one that matched the stone energy um, plot closest was a blend of B72 and B48N. And these are two acrylic adhesives that we are quite familiar with in conservation. And it, they also had the thinnest join. So we had a combination of a reversible familiar adhesive that had the thinnest glue join. So we had a winner for our adhesive. This is after a year of study. <laughs> so here's our winner. Um, it's a blend of these two acrylic adhesives. Um, we also looked at creep testing, which is um, creep is the tendency of a solid material to slowly move or deform permanently under the influence of stress over time. So this is one of the things that was really the big question about acrylic adhesives was whether they could withstand being under, under a load for extended periods of time. I think that we, in conservation, we figured these would creep and, and they wouldn't be able to hold and withstand the weight of a sculpture over time. But our testing, which was done with a similar, uh, the Brazil disc, and then we added this little thing called a crack gauge that's a, attached to, um, a, it's an electric wires are attached to a, a voltage meter and then they're squeezed slowly and then any even the tiniest bit of movement is detected by the voltage meter. And then some really equations happen that I can't explain. <laughs> These are the Princeton guys that if they were here, they'd be able to explain it to you. Um, but um, what our results showed us was that these acrylic adhesives, which we sort of doubted could hold up a sculpture, turns out that they, they have um, a performance, they can perform very well over very long periods of time. So the, they did this, those equations actually extrapolate out the data. And 
I mean, we're talking about 3,000 years, 10,000 years. Basically, these are not going to move. That's the, the takeaway note from this. Um, this was a really big deal to us. So this, this meant that we could use our reversible adhesives and um, are with the thin bond joint. And when Pat and Mike talk, they're going to they're gonna tie back into this, um, uh, the fracture toughness and the creep testing. So remember those um, for later. We also did a lot of pinning research. I'm going to go over this really quickly too, but it was, it was done in several phases. This happened over about a period of about five years. So we did modulus testing, which we just looked at a lot of different pinning materials just to compare the stiffness of those materials. Um, and then we did compression shear tests, which were um, marble cores that were cut on a 45 degree angle and then, and then pushed to failure. And so we were trying to mock up these critical joins in the sculpture, like the knee, where there, there's this really sharp angle, in, in the ankles, where there's also a sharp angle. Um, so we, we sort of had this mock-up approach to the test samples. So here is what some of them look like as they were being fabricated, and then a diagram showing you um, the, what it looks like inside. There's a pin inside that's held in with epoxy. And we tested a lot of different materials, carbon fiber, stainless steel, fiberglass, carbonate, rain, a different range of moduli, which is the stiffness of the material. So with um, uh, stainless steel and carbon fiber being the stiffest and polycarbonate, which is like acrylic, like um, plexiglass kind of, um, being the, the least stiff. So those were pushed to failure. And um, the results showed us something that wasn't very surprising, um, which was that stainless steel, which is significantly stiffer than marble, um, when pushed to failure, causes the marble to break. Now, this isn't something that would happen naturally in the sculpture. The static force is just the sculpture standing alone. It doesn't create enough force to break the marble if there were a little stainless steel pin in there. But we have to think about a lot of different scenarios. What if the sculpture falls down again? Uh, it would, if there were a, a big steel, uh, stainless steel pin inside that sculpture, it would fracture in a similar way to this. It would just kind of explode around the stiff pin. So we wanted something that was more compatible with the marble, and that turned out to be fiberglass. Um, what you see here is a core that's been uh, was assembled with a fiberglass pin. It was pushed to failure, and the thing that failed in this case was the fiberglass rod and not the marble. So this we really liked. It takes a lot of force to do this, so it's strong enough to um, use as a pin in the sculpture. Um, but in the case of another accident, we hope that never happens, but we do have to consider these things. Um, we don't believe that fiberglass would cause any damage to the marble. So this is just the summary of about six years of work. <laughs> B72, B48, and blend, which is our lovely acrylic adhesive. Um, and we had fiberglass rods for the pins. But how are we going to use those materials? We, we still didn't know exactly what we were going to do. Um, one of the drawbacks of an acrylic adhesive is that it um, sets by solvent evaporation. So you never know exactly the moment that that adhesive is, has reached full strength, which is different than a, an epoxy, which it cures by a chemical reaction. Once that chemical reaction is over, it's a known period of time. You're good to go. You can move on with the next project. <laughs> but with acrylic adhesives, you don't really know that. And we, we did a little some empirical studies, excuse me, trying to determine if we could figure out exactly when this um, adhesive reaches full strength. But there's so many variables like the porosity of the marble, the size of the joint, the temperature, and all of these things come into play. So we knew that we had to hold the sculpture for each joint. We had to clamp that joint and hold it 
immobilized for at least a month or two. So this was something that helped us develop our treatment approach. So we're going to next move on to planning the treatment. Um, we worked for a long time indirectly planning the treatment of the sculpture. So we didn't just dive in and start, you know, hey, does this fit together? And, you know, at each time you put a piece of marble, two pieces of marble together and apart, you lose a little, some grains of marble. And we wanted to preserve these beautifully broken fracture edges as much as possible. So um, we really, we agreed pretty early on that we were going to use mock-ups as our strategy for planning. And um, we also knew that the best way that we would um, know if the sculpture even fit together again, because this was, at this point, we didn't even know if the whole thing was going to stack up and, and realign. Um, so we decided to develop an external armature that would allow us to stack up the sculpture without any adhesive. In other words, to dry fit the entire sculpture. And then we would know if the legs all matched up to the torso and everything aligned. At this point, we didn't even know if that was possible. So we knew we had to develop an external armature. We needed it to be quite flexible um, and, and allow movement of each fragment, especially the torso, which the position of, of that torso, the 380-pound piece of, sculpt, of stone, you know, it needed to have fine-tuning fine ability. And we also needed to open and close each join without disturbing the relative position of each fragment. So this is kind of a tall order. And we started with um, David here. This is a, a replica of um, Michelangelo's David. He's quite small. Um, but he was, we purchased it on the internet. <laughs> it was made in China. And we had this idea to buy, to buy a sculpture, but we couldn't just buy a sculpture and break it. Uh, we, we wanted to break this sculpture. <laughs> so we got one that was very clearly like a replica, and, and there wouldn't be any sort of ethical consideration about breaking it. I mean, you could probably make an argument about breaking it, but um, we all agreed that it was probably OK. Um, and then we started buying um, equipment like this, this here, uh, this structure around Adam is called a bridge crane, and that's a, a rigging, rigging system that allows you to move the beam and you can lift things pretty much within the footprint of the, of the, of the system. Um, so to use David as a mock-up, we had to break it. So we marked off all the places that corresponded to Adam's breaks, and we used uh, feathers and wedges, which is just an ancient way of breaking stone. You drill a, drill a hole, and you put little guide feathers in, and then you put in a wedge, and you, you line up a series of feathers and wedges, and then you just start tapping those, and eventually the stone will crack. And that's how we broke um, David. And um, we eventually got to a point where um, we reproduced Adam's breaks as much as possible. There was a little bit of um, recarving that we had to do because this particular David had a tree trunk that went right up the back of his, it was attached to the back of his leg. So we, we did what we could. And then um, we started to design the way that we were going to handle the torso, which I said earlier is about 380 pounds. This is a big piece of stone. It needed to be securely um, fixed in, in a position, and we needed to be able to adjust the moment or the angle of this large fragment. And we just started with basic ideas made out of cardboard, and then um, we thought that we could create a corset kind of style strap that could be suspended from the bridge crane. That was the concept. And so we started mocking things up on the David sculpture. Um, and we used carbon fiber fabric, which um, is a material that can be laminated with epoxy. Uh, you put lots of plastic around the sculpture itself so it doesn't actually stick to the sculpture. You want this to be a removable strap. And then um, the, the carbon fiber fabric is laminated with the epoxy. 
And then we just started building it up so it had this big wide flange that you could then hang it from, from the overhead bridge crane. Um, and then we also started developing those straps for each one of the leg fragments. Um, but the way that those were going to be held, it took a little longer to resolve that. We thought initially that we were going to grab them from behind, um, in, from a grid behind, and then eventually we um, started designing um, in more a closer built cage that would have ball joints and that would allow the flexibility. And I've got lots of pictures of that coming up. So once we were kind of along, you know, getting along about it with concepts with David, we moved to this full scale model of Adam, which was made from the laser scans. And this is the CNC milling procedure. Um, so we had a, a replica of Adam full scale. So we could then turn, take those concepts, apply them directly to the, the model. And then we started making the straps that would actually hold the sculpture itself. Um, and you can see down there at the bottom, the, the ball joints. So there were ball joints tied into a channel strut system and that allowed us all the flexibility we needed. So eventually we were able to transfer these carbon fiber straps to the stone fragments. And it really had a lot of flexibility and it allowed the torso to hang freely. We could, we could actually move the torso to the right or to the left and get it out of the way. We also had a customized uh, lift table built, which is over there. And that table was absolutely key to the project it took about a year just to develop research and develop that table with a company in Germany. <clears throat> but it had the ability to raise and lower the legs so that the torso was the fixed element. And then the, you were able to raise and lower the legs on this lift table extremely precisely. Oh, and this is the, this is the first dry run. So this is the first time we assembled the sculpture, and we knew that everything aligned. So this was, I think that was in 2010. Um, so we knew we were good to go at that point. So then we could actually start assembling and pinning. <laughs> so each time we put, a, we created a join and used adhesive, we, um, we used this dry stacking method. And the, the beauty of this armature was that we were able to use the, the torso itself as the clamping, um, as the, the weight of the sculpture as the clamp. We didn't have to create all kinds of crazy clamps. We just put the legs, raised them up to the torso, and then the torso, the weight of the torso actually bared down on the sculpture and then clamped that particular join. So we did one join at a time each time. Um, reassembling the, tor the sculpture. And I've got a little video here that shows that. So here, Michael and I, that's Michael Morris. The two of us pretty much did all of the assembly. Um, and here we're, we're actually putting, uh, we're adhering the two lower ankles. And so that, these, those two ankles are gonna be the only joints in this little video where there's any adhesive. We put the adhesive on. There's a lot of wiggling to just, very gentle wiggling, not grinding, but just kind of wiggling to get the adhesive to ooze out of the joint and get to where you felt that interface grabbing between the two surfaces. And then we just built the rest of the sculpture back up without any adhesive. Connected it with the ball joints, tightened it down. And then, oh, that's the last, the big thigh piece. And then we can swing the torso over. It's hanging by the corset. You can't see it there, but. Um, and then the next thing is to bring the lift table up to the, cor up to the torso. And we would do that until um, you could just 
barely see the, the torso lift slightly inside of the corset. So we knew we had the full weight bearing down on that join every time. So, and then we just kind of systematically, we didn't go necessarily from the bottom to the top, but we worked our way sort of to the last two joins. Um, and around for like the next hour. Yeah. Let's keep our eyes on it. Yeah, definitely. Obsessively checking. <laughs> so that's the dry stacking method. <laughs> and then um, we, you know, we decided about the ankle pins early on, but one of the big questions was the knee pin. Should we put a pin in that knee with the wedge? And this is something that Pat and Mike are going to talk about in a little more detail. But we, we went to back to finite element analysis to um, look at different ways to approach that, that knee and to decide if, and help us decide if it was a really critical pin. Um, but I'll just tell you now, we did end up putting the pin in. So we have only three pins in this entire sculpture, two in the ankles and one in the knee. And I think this is probably, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an unprecedented number of pins. It's very few pins. Normally you would have a pin in every single join. So um, this one, this was a big deal. This was, as far as I know, the first time you've had such small, and they're also very small. I have an example here. This is the size of the pin in the ankles, and this is the size of the pin in the knee. So this was really about our minimal intervention. We didn't want a big drilling really big holes and putting in giant pins. And this is the drilling setup. It was a complicated um, setup that allowed us to, to drill very precisely. And this is how we were able to use such small pins and remove as little stone as possible. But it separated, it, we aligned the, the fragments. We put laser lines on them and then separated them. And that yellow component on the diagram was placed in between. The relative position of the two fragments was maintained and then a drilling jig was put in between. And then we drilled um, up, straight up and straight down and we got a perfectly aligned hole. And this is actually a really difficult thing to do. <laughs> um, but that's what it looked like. And then we moved on to the knee, which was a whole different drilling jig, same concept, but done separately from the rest of the legs and um, inverted <laughs> for various reasons. But you can see these carbon fiber straps were really handy all the way through. Um, yeah, so there's the pin. It just turned yellow. That's the pin in the knee. So that pin, we decided to, to bridge, it went through the wedge-shaped fragment and was, um, it ended in the, the thigh and the calf fragment. So, um, let's see. So, at, and finally, this is the, the, right before we were doing the final joins, this gives you an idea of where the two, last two joins were. Um, and then eventually, the sculpture, um, some time passed and all of the joins had fully set up and we were able to start to take away the armature and start to see the sculpture again. And it was like kind of amazing, this classical form that revealed itself to us. You know, the, the sculpture is important for its um, classicizing style, um, but somehow without arms and a head, it just seemed kind of natural. I mean, we always wanted to put it back on, but it was kind of an interesting thing to see um, how familiar it looked to us, almost like an antiquity. So then the tree trunk was assembled and the, um, the hand could be put on, and that was a relatively simple step of just using a clamp, a clamping system, just sort of a, a tricked up clamping system, but nothing, no special straps there. Um, and then with the uh, right arm, the right arm was assembled actually several years earlier. It was made of the most, it had comprised the most parts. So it was about 12 fragments just in that one arm. 
we put that together. We had another little mini armature set up there. And then um, that's how it looked right before it went onto the body. And then it got its own strap, just like the corset in, on the torso. And that became the stable um, element. And then the rest of the sculpture went up and down. So it, we sort of switched positions. And then finally, the head went on. And the head is the most dramatic part, but really was in some ways the simplest. It just needed its, we made a, a strap out of cotton um, webbing and um, were able to use a screw jack that was situated in the bridge crane. So we were able to raise and lower it in a very precise way. So once we got it aligned, we put the adhesive, lowered it down, and that was it. So um, next, I'm just going to show you one minute time lapse. <laughs> There's actually a time lapse video on our website that is about three minutes long. It's a little bit different than this, but we, we use time lapse photography a lot at the museum like lately. Um, we have a great photography department that has been really helpful in setting these kinds of things up. But I think it's perfect for illustrating something like conservation, which happens sort of at a glacial pace. Um, but really things are happening all the time, and this is a really good way of illustrating it. But this is the whole process of putting on that arm. It was really one of the most complicated parts of the sculpture. Because it, it attached to the torso in two locations, so we had to, it was really difficult to align. Then it came off of the table for the head attachment because we didn't have enough clearance over the, the top of the torso. Um. <laughs> and um, this is a little animation. This is just to show you yet another way that the, the 3D scanning was um, used by, by this team throughout the many years of the project. This actually shows the order of attachment of all of the fragments. Um, so once the, the legs and the arm and the hand were attached, then the tree trunk comes in and then the right arm and the head. But yet again, the, the finite element model was really critical to creating these amazing didactics, which we used in the gallery and online. And then there's this little branch that was right in between. Um, the sculpture was then moved upstairs to the fifth floor where we have um, natural daylight and it was cleaned. And this is how it looks um, once it's been assembled before cleaning. And then I just have a few because we're conservators and we like before and after shots. So I have a few before and after shots just to show you the extent of the damage and then the way that we filled it. And we actually used um, an acrylic adhesive. This is just an interim stage. We used the same acrylic adhesive, but we mixed in inert materials um, to create something that looked similar to marble, and then it was toned um, with um, a PVA resin mixed with uh, dry pigments. And the fig leaf had a little bit of damage, but significantly it looks a lot better now. This is one of the worst areas. This hand it basically exploded, that pinky finger. And there he is after treatment. And I'm happy to say he's in a beautiful gallery um, made specifically for the sculpture. And we have a small exhibition um, that is devoted to the conservation treatment. So there's two silent screens in there, one that talks about the research and um, engineering analysis. And then the, the next one talks about the actual assembly of the sculpture. So um, next, I'm going to pass it to Pat and Mike, who are going to talk about, oh, excuse me, moving my mic. Um.
Yeah, it's one of those. There we go. Okay. All right, that did not do what we wanted to do here. Let's um, try that. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think we're all set. Microphone's working. Uh, I'm Mike Bach, and uh, uh, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, uh, Pat and I worked on this uh, project for her to do some of the engineering work. And Pat actually is the lead analyst, and I want to get him up here uh, very quickly uh, so that he can talk about most of the modeling he did. Uh, but I'd like to just start off by, you know, when we first uh, were tasked to do this analysis, you'll see that the finite element modeling, which is what we use to predict the internal forces and stresses and, and uh, deformations of, of the model using our computer simulation, uh, Pat's modeling is going to show and predict, you know, what the stresses are in all the different areas based on how we, uh, you know, model the different attach features. But what we really needed to do is know, okay, having those stresses, we first need to know what the failure criterion is. Because if we don't know what failure is, we can't compare what Pat got for his results uh, to, you know, to know whether that would survive and, and to give Carolyn that information. And uh, kind of the reason I got involved was uh, uh, in my career, I've done a lot of fracture mechanics work. And in particular, I spent a, lo a lot of time working in delamination. And delamination is a spe special type of failure that I just will quickly talk about. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on delamination of parts in a uh, turbine engine, which is uh, kind of an odd thing to think about that I was working you know, in, inside a jet engine uh, looking at delamination of parts, and I was going to apply that to to a, a art, a piece of sculpture. So uh, that to me, that's one of the, the fun things about engineering is that you know one minute you're working on jet engines, next thing uh, you're at the Met, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, very quickly, uh, and, and I'll I'll be very brief here. Uh, we're using the finite element technique, and the finite element technique is a uh, numerical computer simulation where we essentially build the geometry of the structure that we're going to uh, model, and, and then we uh, apply the boundary conditions and loads, and we try to predict what the actual uh, structural response will be to those applied loads. And the way finite elements works in my 30-second explanation here <laughs> is that we essentially bring in what we call the CAD geometry, the, the geometrical representation of the model, and then we break it up into these tiny elements that we call finite elements. And each one of those elements, we write the, or at least the computer, writes the governing expressions and equations of the uh, equilibrium. And then we combine and assemble those together and apply loads and boundary conditions. And we get the result in all these little elements. We add them together, and we get the response of the structure. Uh, and we also are going to be talking about stresses here, and just so that everyone understands, a stress is nothing more than an internal force over an area. So stress is force over area. So when you're looking inside any kind of structure, we like to define failure criteria, and we try to uh, understand what's going on by looking at the, the uh, essentially the magnitude of stress. And so we basically say that stress is the normal force over a internal area of a structure. And there are also shear stresses, as Carolyn mentioned, as well. So you can have a shear force over that area. OK, so we have to first look at failure. And there's all kinds of structural failure we can have. In this case, it was uh, pretty interesting because we're dealing with marble, uh, number one. And that's a very brittle structure, and that's why uh, Carolyn had people doing fracture mechanics uh, specimens and testing because brittle materials, as we know, if any of you have ever dropped a plate or something else, you know that the, the fracture isn't always, uh, it, it, it's hard to know what the exact stress is that was going to cause that failure because brittle materials are based on small flaws that, that under a high load will, will fail immediately without any warning. Uh, so. 
we use for a lot of times fracture to describe what happens with the brittle material. So what we're really interested in, kind of looking at brittle, brittle fracture in the marble and also looking at delamination where we're going to glue this structure together. And again, thus I was called in to take a look at, at the uh, delamination parts to help pad out to tell them what the failure uh, is. And just to give you, again, another quick 15 second uh, uh, Overview, in a, the reason delamination is such a difficult thing to model is because when you look at the theory of elasticity and you predict stresses, at, a, at the free edge where you have an interface and you have a free edge where it meets the, you know, the outside of the leg, the stresses that are predicted by Pat tend to infinity. That's called a stress singularity. Now, stress singularities aren't real. They're a consequence of our the way we you know, model things in the theory of elasticity and finite elements. But nonetheless, we have an infinite stress that we can predict, which isn't really going to help us because we know it's not infinite when it's going to fail. So we have to uh, do something different. And I'm not going to get into it, but there's <laughs> many different types of ways you can model delamination uh, and all different kinds of approaches. But as we were meeting with Carolyn at the Met, we found out that, hey, this kind of unknown school near New York that did the testing, I forget the name, I think it was Princeton or something, but <laughs> they had actually already done testing. So we said, well, that's great. We're gonna use this correlation approach where we model their test and where they were getting failure, we can then use that level and say our model will predict the level of stress that's gonna cause delamination. So everything looked great. So uh, Carolyn showed you the, the uh, test specimen, the, the fracture mechanics test specimen, and we created a finite element model of it, and we can run and apply the loads that are, you know, basically uh, putting this thing in compression at various angles, and it's a numerical procedure, so we can run this a million times if we want to try to get all the different angles and, and get the response and see what happens. And uh, they started with just all marble with a hole in it, you know, with this fracture uh, oblong flaw in there. So that's great because we can use that to kind of correlate the marble material properties that we used in our, in our, in Pat's models. Uh, and then they put, they did some specimen that were glued together and then the specimens that were glued together, that's the singular, the delamination singularity. We can look at the failure stress when it delaminates and then we'll have failure information for both the marble and the uh, delamination. So everything looked great. Uh, here's some testing that showed the just the marble uh, uh, results. You know, this is just all marble specimen with no, uh, no adhesive in there. And you'll see that you get some nonlinear response. It's not a straight line. It's a curved line. It's nonlinear. But that's okay. Uh, the good news was a lot of the nonlinearities occur at stresses far beyond anything that the, that the uh, sculpture would ever see. I mean, you know, we're talking when they were doing testing that they're getting to stress levels that are way beyond what we're worried about. So we're really looking at those, you know, the initial part of that curve. And from that, we could c calculate and correlate the marble strength that we could use in Pat's analyses. Um, and they, we did that. And again, when we looked up uh, Carrera marble, we found that uh, you know, there's a wide range of modulus and stiffness for that material. Um, so by using these test specimens, we were able to uh, you basically, basically come up with a very accurate account of what the stiffness would be. Okay, so then we went to the delamination specimens and we started looking into that. And again, at this point, we were at the singularity, at the point where we have the adhesive and if you look at the stress when it comes to a free edge, that stress is you know, starting to head to infinity. And so what we can do is we could just run that and find out what the load level and, and we can come up with a representative stress using a particular mesh density to come up with a failure criterion. Uh, so that was our approach. Everything was great until as we started looking into everything, we found out that almost all of uh, literally all but maybe one of the failures was delaminating. Everything from their specimen testing was failing in the marble. In other words, the adhesives were 
as strong as the surrounding marble material. So what that means at this point is, well, we don't really have to worry too much about the lamination at this point. My job is finished, and I handed it off to, to Pat to say, okay, you really just have to concentrate now on the, on the marble. And jumping ahead, this is uh, one of some of the models that Pat was working on. He'll be talking about it. Uh, just to finish up, to let you know, is when we started looking at some of these interfaces and some of the stresses uh, that were occurring in the marble, because the other problem is when you pin at some of the different joints, or when you when you have when you put this model back together, you do get some higher local stresses. Even though we're just Adam's just supporting his own weight and had done it for many years, uh, there's still uh, the, the potential for localized stresses that we have to deal with. But do, using our failure calculations and using the stresses that Pat generated from all his different models, we the lowest factor of safety that we got was a 5.6 uh, factor of safety, which is in engineering world is awesome, and we're really <laughs> happy with that. So at this point, we're going to jump, you know, it, I'm going to bring Pat up, and he's going to show you and talk to you about the actual finite element modeling uh, that he did. And I want to point out that you know there were other things that we could look at, uh, creep response. But again, Carolyn showed us that the testing is, uh, you know, with the creep wasn't an issue. Um, we looked at some, dyna we, I say here we didn't model some dy dynamic loading, but we did look a little bit at vibration loading to, to make sure some, there wasn't any vibrations that would cause uh, the model, or the joints to fail. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, the next step from, from this approach was to obtain the forces throughout all the model, to change the local stresses at any pinning regions or any uh, uh, interfaces. And then uh, at, for that, I'm going to bring up Pat now to, uh, to continue and talk about his part of it. Thank you. Is my mic on? Hi, I'm Pat. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to be brief as well because we're a little bit uh, over the scheduled uh, time. But one thing I did want to point out is that the snow is abating outside. So the longer I talk, the more safe the roads are going to be. So I may seem like I'm rambling, but I have your personal safety in mind here. Um, I'm, going to start, I'm going to talk about the, the modeling of the full statue. And uh, one of the first challenges to this project or to any finite element model that we create is to get geometry that represents the structure. And most of the things that we get in the engineering world come from a CAD system. So we'll get a nice electronic version of, of some geometry that we can then take into our finite element code and start to create our structural model. Now, unfortunately, back in 1495, there weren't a whole lot of CAD systems out there. So the odds of getting a CAD model of Adam were pretty slim. But the Met had taken a unique approach to scanning all the fragments and then digitally reconstructing or reassembling Adam um, using those, that scanned data. So that was a huge help for us because now we have something that we can use to convert from simple finite el or, uh, solid model geometry to what we call the finite element model where we have the system of equations and where we can evaluate the, uh, the deformation and the resulting strain and stress that's going to occur for various uh, scenarios with the model. Now, one of the issues that we had to uh, deal with is that the resolution of the scanning is only so fine. So Carolyn has mentioned that a lot of these fragments were very clean and they would fit together nicely. But if you look over here, in particular in the knee section, you can see that we were kind of limited by the scanning resolution. So in, in the actual uh, uh, geometry model that we were dealing with, there were a lot of open gaps that we had to, we had to come up with ways to, to deal with the different um, interface effects that could occur there. Now we started out by, in the finite element world, using what are called contact elements. So we brought the two rough surfaces together, and we let the contact elements determine where the two sides of that interface could potentially be touching, all based on that, that surface roughness. Now, what you see here in the center, this is a section of the ankle. In the center here in yellow, you see an open area. So when we press the two pieces together, everything that's in yellow is in what we call a near-field contact, but there is a gap there. The only places where the, where the parts were actually touching in this, at this particular interface are these little tiny areas shown in orange. That's showing the, where the, the actual closed contact. So you can imagine where you have a very small region, and the, the entire weight of the statue is now bearing down on that. What you're going to see is high or peak stress regions where, you, where all that force is being concentrated over these very tiny areas. And 
the reality of the situation is when they, when they brought this together, as Carolyn mentioned, there's a little bit of crushing that's going on there. So, so, so this is going to, some of these little peaks that we see, peaks and valleys, would, would tend to flatten out when the full weight of the structure was bared down on it. But that's not something that was, uh, we were really tasked to do in the finite element model. It's actually something that's fairly difficult to do mathematically. So we had to come up with more effective ways uh, to essentially provide the, the MET conservators with as much information as they, as they could take and so that they could make the best possible decision when they had to deal with the, the pinning aspects of the knees and the ankles. One of the other pieces of information that was, or, or pieces of data that was hugely valuable to us that provided by the MET was this homogeneous model of the statue. So they took the digital version and they were able to fill in the gaps in the cracks and basically smooth it over and make a continuous or homogeneous section in the legs and ankles. That allowed us to create a baseline model of the, fine, of the statue. So we could now apply Adam's weight, we could mesh him up, we could generate his deformation, his strain and stress and say, okay, prior to breaking, we're gonna say that the stresses that we see in these regions are this amount. And now we're gonna compare any potential variation in the pinning or the joining or the gluing to that baseline. So we now have something that, that uh, bas we have a, uh, a basically a landline Right, or, or a, a, a something to compare to to evaluate our, the subsequent changes or the subsequent um, attempts at, at bringing this together. So we, not knowing exactly what the interfaces were going to look like, because you can imagine just about anything could occur when you're bringing the two heavy pieces together. You're trying to get as much glue in there as possible. There could be gaps in the glue. There could be uh, crushing of the marble that, that basically squishes the glue out. So we didn't really know what, ev what any particular interface was going to look like. What we tried to do then was essentially bound the problem. Look at a best case versus a worst case, and then we had an intermediate case called our interlocking interface, which we felt was as close as we could potentially get to what was really going on in the statue. So our baseline case, as I mentioned a moment ago, was the continuous material, right, or homogeneous marble through the knees and the ankles. So we were able to calculate the stresses that were occurring in the ankles and the knee sections, and we said, all right, we've got to make sure that anything that's done is not worse than this. The next step, uh, this was what we would call the worst case scenario. An example here uh, shows the left ankle, was what we called the, the, the smooth cut scenario. And this was very similar to the compression shear testing samples that, they, that the, the MET was doing the testing on. So we thought this was a good way to, to basically uh, help them uh, visualize how the pin would support Adam's weight and have the correlation to the compression shear testing example. So we took a, a very smooth cut through the ankle here and we looked at uh, various scenarios with and without pins, uh, with adhesive, without adhesive, with friction at the interface or allowing it to slide freely to see what would happen to the remainder of the statue. And then the final interface treatment, this is kind of the middle bound area. Uh, this was our attempt to get as, as close as we could to what may, may actually be occurring at the interface. And that was to make an interlocking interface between the two fragments. And the way that we did that was to take the broken fragment pieces, take the surface from the broken piece, bring that then into the homogeneous model and use it as a cutting surface. So we, we did, in doing so, we made two uneven surfaces that were aligned and interlocked. And now we could look at the effect of having friction in there. We could look at the normal forces versus the shear forces at those particular joints. And, and again, give the conservators as much information as we could on so that they could make the best possible decision on where to put the pin, what, you know, uh, what size pin would they need, and, and the various other things. Now, one of the beauties of doing this analytically is that you're not cutting marble. You don't have to do any kind of physical testing. You're just starting to do what-if studies. You can define pin locations, pin sizes, pin lengths, uh, the number of pins in this case parametrically. And it's very, very cost effective to throw these features in and evaluate them and look at cause and effect uh, for the various attempts. Uh, this uh, uh, plot over here on the right shows the stress distribution around the pin. So one of the concerns that they had in terms of the pin material choice was that they didn't damage the marble if the bond were to fail. Carolina mentioned the comparison of stainless steel pins, which caused the marble to crack locally, versus the fiberglass pin, which would shear first, not damaging the parent material. So we were able to also provide some information on the stress distribution if the bond were to fail and the, and the pin were to take up the shear at the interface due to the statue's weight. And she's mentioned the left knee several times. It, because of uh, the challenging nature of the break, you have this inclined angle on the top break versus a flat angle. We looked at a variety of different pin lengths and pin sizes. And I think you have your pin over here, right? Yeah. And this is what they ended up with. So this is a 700-pound statue 
with a, a large bulk of its weight, about a third of its weight, basically potentially being supported by this small pin and shear. Now, Adam is about my size, and I'm looking at this going, that's not a whole lot of material there to hold up. Now, granted, he's got about 600 pounds on me, but, uh, but even so, that's, it's amazing how small they were able to go with these pins to, uh, <clears throat> and to get the, uh, the bond or the, the strength that they needed uh, in terms of the, the shear resistance. So how do we go about uh, assessing these various cases and making an argument to um, the size of the pin or the location of the pin. One of the first things that we did was to look at the force distribution because the force distribution would then govern what the stresses would be locally in the model. So as Carolyn had mentioned, Adam is essentially has three columns. So we, we went and we looked at the force distribution for the homogeneous model through the three columns and then we used that as the baseline to compare what would, could potentially occur based on the joint condition for either one of the ankles or the knees. So over here on the left, um, I have basically the ankle joint is intact, and we calculate the stress. We're, we're animating this just to show you that having the entire structure is also useful because it gives you a way to visualize what's happening and how the structure is actually bending under its own weight. So you can see it leans forward a little bit, but there's a fairly even distribution of stress between the left ankle and the right ankle at the bottom here. If they were to lose the cohesion at that joint, you, if you look over here on the right, you can see that now the center leg, or the right angle, is taking up the bulk of the stress in the situation. So there's a lot more force going down through that section there because this, one is, this ankle over here is, is sliding and no longer supporting that weight. So we then, having this model in place and having the ability to look at various different potential effects at, at those joints, uh, we tried to, again, characterize by doing what-if studies for the conservators. Here's, here's, what, here's the advantage of having a pin. Here's what could potentially happen if you don't have a pin. And, and hopefully that was useful, that information. They had to make a final decision because it, it's, a, it's a permanent and irreversible effect putting that pin in there, and they wanted to be absolutely sure that it was necessary. So if we take the force distribution through the stump, the stump is shown in blue, the right leg here in the center is shown in red, and the left leg is shown in, in green. And we look at the vertical forces that are being transmitted through um, the sections that I'm showing up on the top here. You can see that for the homogeneous statue, or the best case scenario, the right leg is supporting most of the weight. The left leg is doing a pretty good job, but the stump is also supporting some of the vertical forces that are pressing down on it. And I see you kind of expect that. The center column should be supporting most of the weight. If we then go to a situation where we lose the bond on the lower section of the knee wedge, because of the flat nature of that break, it really doesn't have an enormous effect on the stress distribution or the, the forces through that section of the, of the model, through the various sections. You see there's a, there's a minor change in the stump. The right leg is still doing most of the work. The left leg is still, uh, is still involved in the, in the support. If you, however, lose the bond at the upper section on the incline plane, you can see there's a, a dramatic difference in the force distribution between the three columns. And this is something that caught us a little bit by surprise. Suddenly, you can see that the stump forces have gone negative. That means that as Adam is moving forward under his own weight, the stump is now being pulled upward and being put in tension. So it was a complete reversal of force if you lose the bond without a pin at that top section of the knee. So we said, all right, let's now compare that to the same set of scenarios, but let's put a pin in there and allow the pin to take up the shear. So I've simplified this plot a little bit. A little bit. I've taken the, the best case scenario where we have bonded and bonded at the two joints. The pin is really doing no work in that case. It's all being supported as if it were homogeneous marble. And we compare that to the worst case scenario where we lose the bond on both sides of that interface. And you can see there is not a dramatic a wholly dramatic difference between those two cases, best case and worst case. The stump is always staying in tension. The right leg is still supporting most of the weight, but the left leg still has some skin in the game here because he's still supporting a lot of load significantly. And that's all because the pin doesn't allow the statue to shift and slide and force a redistribution of the force to the other members. It keeps the left leg supporting that load. So at this point, we said, all right, well, let's continue to look at force, but look at, let's look at it from a different perspective. Now, when you're, when you're talking about the effect of friction in an interface, it's the normal force, or the force that's perpendicular to that surface, times whatever friction coefficient you may have between the two surfaces. So instead of just looking at pure vertical force, now we're going to look at the normal force at each interface versus the shear force. So we're showing the normal force here in blue and the shear force that we're seeing in the left knee in red. 
And so this is without a pin. This is the best case where it's uh, both joins are bonded. And you can see they're, they're pretty even in, in terms of the amount of force and shear that they're supporting. If we lose that bond on the lower section, not that big a deal on the normal force. It's still allowed to support normal force because even, even if you get a crack, it's still you know, horizontal to the floor. So, however, if you lose that top interface again, bang, the left leg is no longer supporting the weight. There's almost a negligible amount of force that's going through there. That means that all that force is going somewhere else in the statue. It's going into the center leg. It's going into the stump. The stresses are going to be increasing in those regions. So we take the same scenario now, the shear force and the normal force, and we compare the effect of having the pin in there. And we go from, in this case, the, the best case scenario to the worst case scenario, even in the worst possible situation where you have a frictionless interface and you lose the bond on both sides of that knee, the left leg is still going to support shear and normal force. Okay, so Adam is still going to stand. He's not going to twist sideways and, and, and something terribly bad is going to happen. So this was clear justification that the pin needs to be in the left knee. And, the, and again, with a finite element model, you're able to emulate all these different scenarios and look at cause and effect very easily, very quickly, very cost effectively, as opposed to building up mock-ups and trying to test each one of those scenarios. So just to compare now the effect of having a pin or not a pin for the best case, if you look at the best case scenario where, where you have fully bonded interfaces between the two um, <clears throat> pinned or unpinned, you can see they're essentially they're doing the same thing. Right? The pin is not playing any role provided that you maintain the bond on both sides of that kneecap. And I have a little animation there. You can kind of see the, uh, Adam's uh, movement under his own weight. We've exaggerated that a little bit just to kind of give you a feel. Now let's jump to the worst case scenario where Again, you lose, that, uh, you lose the bonding on those two faces, and you don't have a pin. The left knee is no longer, the left ankle in this case, is no longer supporting any of the weight. So you can see what's happening here. The left leg is hardly moving. Again, this is exaggerated in the deformation. The whole statue is starting to shift on that crack plane, and the left leg is just staying stationary because it's not supporting any load. If we go to the opposing side, where we place the pin in, you can see there's still some movement of that left leg because the pin is forcing the parts to stay in line and still maintaining a high degree of the load distribution. So at this point, I think it was like a no-brainer. You've got to have the pin in there. And, and you know, I don't know if you wanted to comment anything, on anything else on that. Can you turn my mic on? I don't know, my, uh, I, you know, Pat and I were going over the talk, and I, and I am as recalling these moments where I, I just had like a major transformation of my opinion because I think we, we disagreed in our team about whether to put a pin in this knee for a, a period of about two years. We weren't in agreement. And, but when these guys were showing me the way that the force redistributes itself to one of the most vulnerable places in the sculpture, which is where the tree trunk meets the, the hip, which okay. I knew was basically just like nothing, nothing, barely touching. Um, I didn't want to ever place the sculpture in a position where that was what we were depending on, the connection between the, the hip and the tree trunk. And Excellent. for me, this was the moment where, where I decided we have to have a pin. There, there's a lot of different reasons that I could, you know, if we're chatting sometime, I can talk to you about a lot of different reasons. But for me, this was kind of a clinching moment. Um, because of the consequences of not having a pin there. So, um, but we still didn't agree. I mean, this is something that took a long time. You keep going. <laughs> I just want to point out, when you say we, we were in agreement with you, Caroline. But no, I know. You <laughs> no. guys had no problem well, with a pin. <laughs> we, we went into this project at knowing, as engineers, you know, we know nothing about art. So what we can tell what we do know is structures. And we can tell you everything that we think this structure is going to do. And then it was very interesting to, to watch you process that information and come back and say, OK, we think we need to do this. And silently, we were going, yes. But you know, we, we, it, it, was, it was interesting because we were, we're coming much, at it from two completely yeah. different disciplines. But I think we were able to, to, uh, to find a way to, to, to really meld those together effectively. So. Oops. Oh. I didn't mean to do that. And it went all the way to the end. Sorry, so I have one more conclusion page. It's a max, so the mouse is upside down. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, 
when we stepped into the project and found out that the MET team had already done an extensive amount of testing with the Brazil samples, that was wonderful news to us because the, very often as engineers, you don't get that kind of information from your customer or the person that you're trying to work for. We're al always asking for that information so that we can get greater fidelity of our, our model result. They had that information. They didn't, they didn't test it in the way for, for reasons that we were going to use it, but it was there and we were able to, to take it and pull from it some very valuable uh, material property data. The scanning of the fragments and the digital reconstruction of the statue, as I mentioned earlier, was huge, huge, because that allowed us to then go right into creating the finite element model and starting to do the actual analysis. Uh, we tried to, wherever possible, make the interface, interface treatments parametric so that it would be just a matter of changing a number and a click of a button to regenerate the next, uh, the next configuration and generate the result. So we were able to, to do those what-if studies very quickly and very uh, cost-effectively. And again, the what-if studies, let's try to characterize, because we can, uh, every potential scenario that could occur. And so we have an idea of basically the, the advantage or disadvantage of, of using pins in particular regions of the statue. And then lastly, applying engineering theory and experience to a work of art was new, was novel for me, and it was very, very exciting and gratifying. So we were privileged to be part of this project. So, and that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's that? We got about five minutes for Q and A. Okay, great. So one or two questions. Anybody? Sure, sir. Why you didn't need a pin in the left arm that's only supported on one end? Right. Uh, well, that that joint it it turned out our finite element modeling showed us that this arm weighs about forty five pounds. We actually ended up, uh, we thought about using a pin here extensively. We did a lot of, I, I didn't even have time to talk about this today, but we did a lot of tensile testing where we, we pulled pins out of marble, and the results were quite disconcerting. We never, we didn't want to drill here. We didn't want to put a pin in tension because of the, the marble in tension is quite weak. And so um, we felt it wasn't necessary, and we ended up, doing an epoxy joint here, um, but, but using the bar that B72, that reversible adhesive, as a barrier on either side of that epoxy, so that this is an, an epoxy joint that is reversible. So we, we created like a sandwich of reversible adhesive with epoxy in between. So we used slightly stronger adhesive there. I think we could have used the acrylic there, but we chose to do that um, Partly because of logistical reasons, um, it was it was faster. Uh, one more question over there, Mark. Sure. Yep. Um, I'm an art historian, and I'm absolutely thrilled to see these two very different disciplines working together and helping each other. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, sure, Nick. Well, last last question. Uh, just a question about. Do we know, do you know uh, wh how the statue went about falling and why it fell? Uh, the pedestal that it was on wasn't strong enough to, uh, it, it's, it wasn't strong enough to support the weight of the sculpture. It was uh, made of plywood, but it wasn't the plywood itself that failed, it was the joinery. So it just wasn't built sufficiently strong enough to support the weight of the sculpture. And it just, one night it just buckled and um, it fell down like this on one side, yeah. And so the sculpture fell on its side like this. Yeah. It's very sad. Scary moment. It really was in history. <laughs> not a good moment. Thank you very much for that. Thank you.